Hello everyone, um, my name is Jeff Bennett and I work for Infinera. You may know us as a manufacturer of long haul and submarine transponders. Um, there's a growing interest of course in, uh, I think as Dirk mentioned actually, uh, moving coherent towards the edge of the network. So that's uh, an aspect that I'll be uh, talking about now. So uh, what we just heard, if I could uh, summarize it really at a very high level, imagine you're in a data center and of course you've got a whole bunch of rack top switches. One decision that you may make is your uh, connectivity inside the data center. And there you'll use client interfaces. They're almost always pluggable these days. They use gray optics, which means we don't care about what color they're transmitting. They'll only be one wavelength on a fiber anyway. Uh, maybe multiple wavelengths, but all shared by the same uh, interface. And generally we're talking about services like 100 gigabit ethernet to 400 gigabit ethernet. But there's an entire world of course that exists outside the data center. And we, we saw that very briefly at the end of the last presentation with 400 ZR and ZR plus. We refer to these as line side interfaces and Historically, they've always been integrated. In other words, they're not pluggable. They're built onto a line card, they're built into an appliance, et cetera. And they use WDM optics, which means that they're tuned to a particular uh, frequency and you can get multiple frequencies on a single fiber. The trend is to move those kinds of interfaces towards pluggable form factors. So this is the bit that I'll be talking about really. And in the context of the access network, now I won't be very uh, talking very much about 400 ZR and I'll, I'll just explain why that is. Because um, if you think about uh, this decision, it's the idea of choosing between client side optics versus line side optics. Um, and if you are making that decision, there's a whole range of different factors you've got to consider. Cost, size, power. Now. All of these add up to limitations on what kind of pluggable form factor you could potentially use. Because if the power consumption of a coherent implementation particularly uh, is too great, you won't be able to fit into a small form factor. You won't be able to dissipate the heat. Now that then has an impact on faceplate density if your target platform is something like a switch or a, a router. So one of the goals of 400ZR is actually to make those factors less relevant by compromising on the optical reach, uh, the idea is that you can consume less power, you can fit into a nice convenient pluggable form factor. But there are some problems with 400 ZR. And um, it is of course 400 gig, it's very short reach and it's point to point. And you may say, well, hang on a second, those aren't really problems, they look like features because it, it is after all 400 ZR. Well, the problem about 400 gig is it's a very high data rate for short reach applications in the access network. It's also too short a reach for applications that need 400 gig data rates. And what's this issue of point to point? Why is that a problem? Uh, surely all optics is point to point. You put photons in at one end of a fiber, they fall out the other end. Well, let's have a look at an access network. And here's the stuff that we need to connect into that network. 4G, 5G cell towers, next gen cable access, uh, next gen enterprise and so on. And then these connect into some kind of optical edge location. And of course you go uh, fiber into the core. You may have a variety, variety of technologies from the optical edge outwards because obviously you've got the radio access network in the case of cell towers. You might have some copper still in the network and so on. Now, depending what part of the industry you're in, you may know the optical edge locations as the hub sites, it could be the uh, street cabinets or hub sites in cable systems, in building equipment, local exchanges and so on for enterprise. But the key thing is that what you're doing is a series of aggregation steps. So all of these optical links are point to point but the traffic that you're carrying, the patterns of the traffic are not uh, point to point. And you look at the data rate of different parts of the uh, pathway, the data rate between the optical edge and the aggregation is really determined by uh, a set of economics. And that economics is that you don't want, or you can't afford actually, 
to put too high a data rate transponder or pluggable into something like a cell tower. It just doesn't make sense. But equally, if you look at this point in the network between aggregation and hub sites, that's also determined by economics, but it's a different set of economics. It's the economics of the faceplate density on the switches and routers that you're using in the hub site. And that could be basically to max out uh, the capacity or the data rate that you can get from an individual pluggable. Today, it's 400 gigabit ethernet, but as we've heard, uh, we're moving to higher data rates for those client connections. So we need electrical aggregation at these intermediate points to perform that speed change. But you could say, well, hang on, why can't we just plug these sites directly into each other, especially if you're moving towards coherent technology that has really good optical reach that could potentially drive an optical signal all the way through the access network from the cell tower quite a long way uh, and, and economize in that way. Well, there's a bit of a problem because if you look at the signal from a 25 gigabit uh, connection in a cell tower, it might look something like that. Over on the right-hand side, this is the kind of signal that you would see in a hub site with a 400 gigabit carrier. Now, clearly, the 400 gig signal is wider, its spectrum is wider. It will also be using a different modulation, probably. Uh, it may not even be coherent uh, at this stage. You could have a direct detect system. But even if it is coherent, perhaps it's using a, a different form of modulation. Instead of 16, uh, 64 QAM, it could be using QPSK. It's also framed differently. The interface out in the cell tower would actually be framed as 25 gigabit ethernet. The interface in the hub is, is gonna be 400 gigabit ethernet framed. So you need a sophisticated device in between the two to provide that data rate change, but also the framing and the modulation uh, translation. Now, to solve that problem, uh, as the title, the full title of this presentation suggests, uh, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be using something called subcarriers. So I need to just give you a little bit of background about what they are. If we turn the clock back to around about 2010, which is when the first generation of coherent technology was launched, if you were to put an optical spectrum analyzer onto the fiber and have a look, you would see something like this, which is a, a tall central peak with side lobes. Now that's a, a classic phase modulated signal. And uh, first generation coherent, amazing technology, increased reach and data rate in our networks dramatically. Now the output from that single laser is called a carrier. And you put a lot of those signals onto uh, a DWDM fiber by squeezing them as close as you can together. But a few years later, we moved on to second generation coherent, and that had some additional transmitter shaping components. And you can do some clever things using algorithms that were originally um, proposed by a guy called Harry Nyquist. He was a researcher at Bell Labs in the late 1940s. Uh, one of the founders of information theory. And so we call this Nyquist shaping. And what you see here is not just crude filtering. We're not just trimming off the lobes. We're actually putting the information in those lobes into the central part of the signal. And it's a much more compact signal. It means you can squeeze them closer together. Uh, and by the way, for those of you who, who are familiar with uh, flexible grid line systems, this kind of technology was very useful for, for FlexGrid. But you can take that a stage further. Now, this is not a misprint. It's still second generation coherent. But what we do, we modify the algorithms in the transmitter shaping and actually separate the single carrier into multiple subcarriers. And so we, because it's using Nyquist shaping algorithms, we call them Ny Nyquist subcarriers. So um, the advantage with using subcarriers is is uh, quite interesting because the middle diagram here with the uh, with the shaped signal um, all of that information is modulated together and it's modulated at quite a high uh, board rate symbol rate the problem with a lot of fiber um, uh, impairments the, the bad stuff that happens to signals when they travel down fiber is that they're board rate dependent so um, the higher the board rate, the, the worse those uh, 
impairments are. But with subcarriers, you can modulate each subcarrier at a, an independent board rate, and it's, it's a fraction of the, of the overall board rate. So you still get a high data rate signal, but it suffers from uh, lower impairments. Now, the thing about subcarriers in uh, when they were first introduced, they were always used for long haul networks or subsea networks. So they always traveled between the same two endpoints, they're point to point, just like every other optical technology that's ever been designed. And that's, that's fine for those kinds of applications. So you have a, a system which offers better performance with the same spectral width. Uh, and so that's how they were first used. But what if you could send subcarriers from the same laser, but send them to different places? Now, you could do that wh where the black circle that I'm showing here could be an optical switch. Now that's fine, but we're talking about access networks here, and that would actually be quite expensive to build an optical switch with that level of precision to deploy it in the, in the access network. You can do it in a, a long haul network, it will cost in, but not in access. So what, how could you use subcarriers in this way? Well, let me go back to this diagram where we've got the high data rate in the hub site, the 400 gig signal in the hub site. So it's still generated by one laser, but you apply Nyquist subcarrier uh, shaping to that signal, and we break it down into 16 subcarriers. And each subcarrier is independently modulated, and it's framed as 25 gigabit Ethernet. You send it into the optical network, and the device here is just a simple passive optical splitter. It doesn't consume any electrical power. It works forever because it's basically just a piece of glass. And it literally sends copies of that 400 gigabit signal to every one of the endpoints. And you think, well, gosh, you're dividing up the power of that signal, but it's okay. This is a coherent transmission. So it has very, very good optical reach. So what arrives in one of these endpoints looks something like this, which is where the endpoint has decided to tune in to one of those 16 subcarriers. Uh, and hence it gets 25 gigabit uh, ethernet signal. Now, so does this uh, other endpoint. It tunes into a different one of the subcarriers, but it's receiving all the other ones. And again, you might think, oh, gosh, you know, that doesn't sound very secure, but we do this all the time with uh, radio signals. Uh, and now encryption comes free of charge with uh, optical chipsets. So all you do is you, you give the guys the appropriate encryption key for the subcarrier signal that they want to receive. What happens if the upper device starts to grow in terms of capacity? So what you can do, if you originally make this, instead of it being limited to a 25 gig pluggable, you literally deploy 100 gig pluggables everywhere. So what it can do then is turn on or tune into another subcarrier. So it now has 50 gig of capacity as the demand is growing and 75 gig and 100 gig. And you've done all of that without sending engineers in trucks to change any interfaces. Everything is done under software control. Now, if you've been paying attention, there should be some questions at this point. So you could say, well, hang on, does the router have to explicitly support XR? Because if you think about this uh, upper example, that's a 100 gigabit signal, but it, it looks like four 25 gigabit ethernets. So unless the router is aware that that's what's coming out of the back end of the plug, uh, it's not going to like it. Well, it doesn't have to explicitly support it. It could support Flex, -E, Flex Ethernet, uh, which would allow it to understand that signal. But also, you could actually put onto the uh, pluggable, it's very simple now to put a, essentially a, uh, a simplified Ethernet switch that would combine the 25 gigabit Ethernet signals into a single 100 gigabit Ethernet signal. So it the router wouldn't even need to know that this was a, uh, an XR component. So what about buying 100 gig at every endpoint when you may only need 25 gig? Does that actually cost in? Well, yes, it does, because uh, this would be licensed bandwidth. So you'd buy the 100 gigable plug, you'd pay for 25 gig, and then you would buy additional licenses to turn on the, uh, the other subcarriers. So it stays uh, as a competitive price. And then the, the big one, of course, is when can you have it? Well, this is really a, um, at the uh, formulation stage now. Uh, we reckon 2022. Uh, so 
the reason that, that we're uh, promoting this into service pro pro providers is it's so they can uh, design this into their network plans now. Now, one of my colleagues has actually produced this very nice video. Um, and because I'm feeling lucky, uh, I'm actually going to try running this over Zoom. So um, the idea is that you have uh, a simple network here. You've got the cell tower over on the left hand side. You've got some central offices going into an aggregation point and then a data center. So let's take a look at, at this journey. And what we're going to do is have a table here that clocks up the number of transceivers, the number of switches and routers and transport boxes as we pass through the network. And um, you can see on the left hand column, we've got conventional optics, the right hand column, we've got XR optics. Inside uh, or at the bottom of each diagram, we have some uh, detail about the network at that point. So we've already clocked up a lot more transceivers by moving to this approach, because essentially at these aggregation sites, we've literally ripped out the intermediate switches and routers. You don't need them anymore. And by the time you get to the data center and we clock up total of 64 conventional transceivers versus seven transceivers for XR optics, 19 switches and routers in the path with conventional versus four for XR optics, and we can get rid of the transport boxes entirely. And again, you may have different terminology for some of these different devices in your networks, but these networks have actually been um, uh, validated by a number of different customers. Ooh, why is that not moving on to the next? There we go. Um, and so uh, they have been validated by a, a number of different uh, carriers. In this case, we have a very nice uh, joint study with BT. It was presented at uh, ECOC at the end of last year, modeled with 1500 or more nodes. And uh, it, it was only the first phase of the study because this only considered the CAPEX saving in using an XR approach. Uh, the next stage of the modeling would be to, to say, well, if we're getting rid of all of these different routers, surely we're gonna be reducing uh, rack space, we're gonna be reducing power consumption, uh, reducing the truck rolls because of that pay as you grow at the edges of the network and also simplified uh, operations activity. XR is actually a consortium. Um, we are already working with uh, uh, Lamentum and also with 2.6 uh, on the development of the, of the modules. And it's an open invitation to other uh, vendors who'd like to get involved. So really just to summarize the coherent landscape, uh, and it, it, it will tie in some of what Dirk was talking about as well just now. Um, you can look at the optical market as a series of different segments. So we've got Metro Access, Metro Core, we've got Long Haul Terrestrial and Submarine. And then we've got Data Center Interconnect that kind of sits off to one side because some Data Center Interconnect is very short reach. It, it's really about guys like Microsoft or Facebook wanting to build uh, metro data centers because they can't get buildings with enough capacity in one place in, in, a, in an urban environment. So they join together lots of different buildings around the city. But then you also get data center interconnect that's long reach. Uh, it could be international, it could be transoceanic. Um, and, and so it's a really interesting market in that respect. But you can see that most of these markets fit perfectly well with the conventional approach to optical technology, which is point to point. But Metro Access is very definitely point to multipoint in terms of its traffic patterns. So there's a, a, a really good opportunity to use a different approach for Metro Access. ZR is gonna play heavily in data center interconnect. ZR plus maybe for Metro Core, I'd slightly disagree uh, with, with Dirk in that um, I don't really see ZR plus as a long haul technology because you've got to turn the data rate down so far with ZR plus. Um, so it, it would be difficult for it to compete. Um, you know, 6,000 kilometer reach for ZR plus at 100 gigabits per second, that sounds good. But today we're running 800 gigabit transponders with six and a half thousand kilometers reach. So uh, it, it would be difficult for, for 400 ZR to compete with uh, ZR plus rather to compete with the high performance embedded transponders that are being used in long haul terrestrial and submarine. Now, if your demand is very low, I can easily see that ZR plus might have a, have a part, 
but for the major users of the technology, it's probably going to be the, the embedded technologies. And then XR optics playing its part in Metro Access. So hopefully that's given you a flavor uh, for the technology, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. I, I'm absolutely blown away. My mind has gone <laughs> absolutely exploded. Um, I'm sure there are going to be some questions after that because it was so detailed and in-depth and, and technical. Over to you, Leo. Yes, we do have um, one question lined up, which I'm about to read out uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Blakely Willis. Uh, but I'd also like to remind people that uh, if they have a question, they can either type it into the Q&A box or uh, they can uh, ask their question themselves and just type into the Q&A box that you would like to ask your question yourself and raise your hand and I will um, then uh, unmute you. So I'm going to read the question uh, from Blakely first. Great talk, thanks. Um, what would you say are the advantages and drawbacks of XR versus self-tuning DWDM PON with AAWGs? Mm. I mean, I would, I, I think the PON approach is really still a point to point approach. So one of the drawbacks would be uh, when you have to uh, increase the data rate out at the very edge, it's truck rolls, it's new transponders, uh, and it's very often new transponders at both ends. So um, it, it's, uh, it's an upgraded transponder in the cell tower, let's say, but then of course you've, you've got to go to the other end of that link and upgrade the transponder uh, in, the, in the aggregation switch. I mean, that's one aspect, um, plus the fact that you still need aggregation switches, whereas with an XR approach, they just go away. Um, and it's an all optical approach between uh, the two systems. The I remember seeing a presentation from BT, it's got to be getting on for 15 years ago now, where they talked about hyper fine tuning of uh, lasers to, uh, to direct traffic through their network and how much that all optical approach would save them in terms of power consumption with five and a half thousand telephone exchanges around the UK. And it's a, th th what this is really doing is, is delivering on that vision, um, except you don't need the hyper fine tuning anymore. You, you're doing a broadcast and select uh, approach at the receiver. So uh, the other big advantage I would say for XR would be pow power consumption saving. Thank you. Um, we also have a hand up from Tom Hill who wanted to uh, speak on the same uh, subject. So I'm going to uh, allow you to talk, Tom. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leo. Um, Jeff, a wonderful presentation. Um, I happen to work for BT, but I don't work in the same area that uh, may have been working on the um, project you, you mentioned 15 years ago. So just keep that in mind. Um, but I was very curious as to whether or not there is scope within XR to utilize a larger number of smaller subcarriers, um, perhaps a 32-way split at 12.5 gig, or maybe even a, a 64 split at 5, well, 6-ish mm. gigabits per second. Um, wh what are the complexities to doing more smaller subcarriers? Um, and, you know, it, it kind of leads into can this be used as an alternative to ponds? Um, we've tried, uh, we've, we've done some modeling down to 6.25 gigahertz. Uh, so the, the biggest problem there, once you, once you get too many subcarriers, uh, is I guess it's, it's not a high enough data rate to make it worthwhile. I wonder if I'm expressing this correctly, actually, because I, I, know, that, I know that we did look at the, at the lower data rates and we've actually settled on 25 gigabits based on, um, uh, basic, based on meetings with a number of different customers. It seems to be about the right data rate. There were quite a few people asking for uh, 10 gigabit, as you could imagine. But we, 
what we need to do is minimize the number of variants of pluggable so that we can get the volume. Uh, because this is going to be like anything else. It's going to be, you know, the, the economies are going, uh, are going to be coming partly from uh, volume manufacture. And so I think that's why 25 gigabits was chosen. And I also think that this is not intended to directly compete with PON because um, PON can be extremely inexpensive. I mean, it, 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 it kind of depends on, on what you're trying to do. Um, the applications are more about connecting a cell tower or um, a sort of a, a business Ethernet access device or a high capacity street cabinet rather than uh, go that next step, which is, you know, fiber to the home. Does, does that make sense? I've rambled a bit there. It, it does. Um, mm. I mean, I would, I would be fascinated to have a longer discussion about it. I don't want to monopolize the microphone or the questions, mm. um, but I am interested in whether or not the, the economics could support a, a, a multi-mode 16 or 32 split of subcarriers and whether or not that could actually scale well enough for your, you know, your commodity optics to be um, cost effective. But, mm. yeah, it's, it's, mm. it's a big, it's a big topic, but curious yeah. question anyway. Thank you. Yeah. We do not have any more questions in the queue. Um, so um, I'm going to hand back uh, to the chair. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.